From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. I want you to turn with me to the sixth chapter of Matthew, and Jesus is speaking. And he says this, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and materialism. Jesus said that. You've got to make up your mind. Now I find the psychological and spiritual and moral vacuum in the United States and in Europe and America and many other parts of the world. Millions of young people have no purpose for living and no motivating challenge. And young people are restless, I find. They want a cause. They want a song to sing. They want a flag to follow. And into that type of a situation came Hitler. He found Germany with millions of young people unemployed, millions of young people marching and demonstrating for this cause and that cause, and into that vacuum came Hitler and built that mighty military machine that almost conquered Europe and the world. Ernest Hemingway, the great writer, once said, I live in a vacuum that is as lonely as a radio tube when the batteries are dead and there's no current to plug it into. And you know, there are many young people that just never make up their mind. They never make a definite decision. Now, Christ never allowed us to be bystanders or spectators when it came to him. The word Christian actually means a partisan for Christ. It means that you have chosen Christ and you're following Christ. And partisans are never neutral. And we see today radical young people all over the world stirring up trouble, bombing hotels, bombing in airplanes, hijacking planes. They're following some sort of a cause and a lot of times we don't know what their cause is. They are restless. They want something to do. Somebody said the best thing that could happen in some parts of the world was to have a war. May God forbid. But young people want something. And these young people that we're reading about in our newspapers every day and watching on television, they never play it safe. They never sit on the fence. They're never spectators. In the struggles of our times, they commit themselves to whatever their cause may be. And I want to ask you, are you a Christian? I mean a true Christian, a real Christian. Somebody asked a, an Anglican down in London when we were down there. They were trying to witness and they said, are you a Christian, sir? He said, I've been an Anglican all my life and nobody's going to make a Christian out of me. And down in Texas, they ask a, a man on the street in Fort Worth, Texas, said, are you a Christian? He said, no, thank God I'm a Baptist. <laughs> the word Christian was used first in derision. It's a term of reproach. And many people have a wrong idea of what a Christian is, is really like. They say, well, a Christian is a person who prays. Christians pray, but that doesn't make you a Christian, a true Christian. Or they live by the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. That doesn't make you a Christian. You may be sincere. I watched a man in an American football game, and there were 90,000 people in the Rose Bowl in Pasadena, California, and he carried that ball down the field. The crowd cheered, but he ran the wrong way and got a goal for the other team and lost the game. He was sincere. My mother was sincere when I was a little boy and gave me what she thought was cough syrup for my cold and gave me iodine. And she called up quickly the doctor and the doctor said, give him some cream. Well, we had a little dairy farm with about 60 cows and she almost filled me up with cream. You say, well, a Christian is a person that goes to church. Yes, a Christian ought to go to church, but that doesn't make you a Christian. You can be baptized. And you can do all of those things. And you can be called Christian, but I'm talking about a real, genuine, personal relationship with Christ. Do you have that? Or one who keeps the Ten Commandments. I've never met anybody that kept the Ten Commandments. I haven't kept them. 
You haven't kept them. Did you know that everybody in this stadium and everybody watching has broken every commandment? The Bible says that if you break one commandment, you've broken them all. So we've broken the whole of the Ten Commandments, and that is called sin in the Bible. And the Bible says all have sinned and come short of God's requirements, come short of God's glory. Now, first, a Christian is a person who has made a choice. Secondly, a change has taken place in his life. And thirdly, he's accepted a challenge. And I want to make those the three things I want to emphasize. First, he's made a choice. All the way through the Bible, we're asked to make a choice. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden made the wrong choice. They rebelled against God. They chose to build the world without God. And they made a mistake, a terrible, tragic mistake, and we're paying for it today because all the problems in the world today, including death, comes from the fact that our first parents broke God's law and passed it on to Cain and Abel, their children. They, Cain became a murderer and passed it on to you and me. And we're all capable of sin and we all sin. David said, in sin did my mother conceive me. I was born in sin. We're sinners by choice. We're sinners by practice. Every choice we make affects others. Moses before he died, said to all the people of Israel, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life, and both you and your children will live. Choose, he said. He said to the people of that day, you have to make a choice. And a little bit later, the next man that followed him was named General Joshua. And Joshua, the 24th chapter, had all the people of Israel before him at Shechem. And he said, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. Are you going to serve God or are you going to serve yourself? Choose, he said. And then he said, as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. And Elijah was a great prophet of God. And he once had... 450 prophets of Baal, who, who was a heathen god. And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long are you going to halt between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. If Christ is who he claims to be, follow him. Because I tell you this, if Christ is not who he claims to be, we're in trouble. I don't see any hope in the world at all. And the only hope is Christ. Yes, you have to make a choice. Jesus said, enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. He said, only a few people are on the narrow road that leads to heaven. The vast majority are on a broad road that leads to judgment, destruction, and hell. Which road are you on? It's what you do about Christ that counts because, you see, Christ came to die on the cross and the cross becomes the door. It becomes the gate. And if we'll enter that narrow gate of the cross and the resurrection and say, yes, Lord, I believe, I turn from my sins, I'm willing to change my way of living, and we enter the narrow road, It'll be rocky and rough and tough, but at the end is heaven. And while on that road, there's a new resource and a new power and a new joy and a new love that God gives you. Now, secondly, a, a true believer, a true Christian, is a person who has made a change in his life. And that's done by the Holy Spirit. The moment you receive Christ, the Spirit of God comes to live in your heart and it says in 2 Corinthians, therefore if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, old things are passed away, behold all things become new. You become a new person and he's the one that does it. He performs that act in your life. 
Yes, a true believer is one in whom a change has taken place. Has a change taken place in your life? You see, you act the way you believe. The Bible is clear. The change from a defeated, problem-oriented young person depends on first changing your mind. I'm going to ask you tonight to change your mind about God, about Christ. Because you see, our problems and emotional upsets and feelings and behavior and goals are all rooted in the wrong basic beliefs about how to meet our personal needs in life. Our problems with sex or with peer pressure. Christ can take charge of all that if you'll let him. And then a true believer is a person who has accepted a challenge. Jesus said, if any man will come after me and deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. In other words, you deny self, your own selfish ambitions, your own selfish sinful pleasures. You deny that. And then you turn and take up a cross. What did he mean by that? He means that you are going to die with him. The cross was a place of executing criminals. He said, when you go back to your school, back to your neighborhood, back to your work, and tell them that you have received Christ, you may receive persecution. They may laugh at you. They may make fun of you. Your peers and your friends will maybe no longer have anything to do with you. You might lose some dates. You'll have to pay a price. Many of the people that followed Jesus when he talked about death and he said, I'm going to die, they quit following him. They didn't understand the deeper meaning of his death. They didn't realize that when he died on the cross, that was the only hope that they will ever have to get to heaven and to have their sin forgiven. Because when he shed that blood on the cross, that is the only hope that we have in this life or the life to come. Now I know that some young people in America at least resist the idea of a choice of any sort. It's been called the generation of the uncommitted. They don't want to be called narrow and they don't want to close their minds, but Jesus clearly taught that there are two roads and you have to choose which road. There are two masters and you have to choose which master you're going to surrender to and there are two destinies, heaven or hell, and you have to make the choice. Because you see, God doesn't make the choice for you. God gives his son. He helps you to make the choice by sending his Holy Spirit to convict you, to speak to you. But ultimately, you make your own choice. He gave you a gift he didn't give to his other creatures. You can choose what kind of life you're going to live, and there's nothing God can do about it. You can choose what you're going to believe, and there's nothing God can do about it because he gave you a gift of free will. You can say, I will or I won't, I will or I won't. Which will it be for you? I will or I won't. That's the decision that you'll have to make. You see, there's death to every other choice. You cannot travel both roads. You die to one road when you go down the other. If you choose to marry one girl, you can ordinarily marry another. I said ordinarily. Life never allows that kind of neutrality. Jesus does not allow you to be neutral about him. Try to be neutral in politics and you soon are confronted with the ballot box. But some people do not want to be involved in their neighbor's problems. And there's a time when you must stand up and be counted. Jesus demands that you decide about him. Pilate asked, what shall I do? with Jesus, which is called the Christ. What are you going to do? What is your decision? Before you leave here, you have to make a decision. It'll be, I won't or I will. I won't or I will. Pilate washed his hands and said, I don't want anything to do with him. You have to make a decision. Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And Peter answered, you're Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Peter, you're right. Then some are too reluctant to make a choice for Christ because of theology about the Bible. They're not sure about God. They're not sure that you can prove God. No, you can't prove God. 
You can't prove that God exists. You cannot go to a scientific laboratory and say, here's God in a test tube. We accept God by faith. Everything in nature tells us there must be a God. I have a watch here. It didn't just fly together. This universe that runs in perfect precision. There's a supreme being out there somewhere. We call him God. And when Helen Keller, who was blind and deaf and dumb, when they first communicated with her, they used the word God, and she said, I knew him, but I didn't know his name. There is a God, and the Bible tells us that he's a spirit, and he created the world, that he's from everlasting to everlasting. And he said, I am the Lord, I change not. But God also says that he's a God of love. He loves you. He's interested in you. He has the hairs of your head numbered. He loves you with an everlasting love, and he wants to forgive you. He wants to come into your life and into your home and into your work and into all your relationships and help you. He wants to be the pilot of your plane. He wants to be the pilot of your boat or your, the driver of your car, the car of life. And then there's some young people that will raise the question about the Bible. Can we trust the Bible? Job said, I've esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. The scripture says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. God inspired the Bible. I don't understand everything in the Bible. You can ask me questions in the Bible that I cannot answer. I accept it by faith as the word of God, and it's changed my life. And it feeds my soul. Every time I read the Bible, any part of the Bible, I don't care where I open up. It speaks to me. It's a living book. It's not like a history book. It's not a book of science. It's a book about faith. It's a book about God. It's not just a book on philosophy. It's not a book just on religion. It's a living book that speaks to you as you read it. There's a supernatural power in reading that book. And then there's some young people that talk about conversion, and they think of conversion as some dramatic experience in which they hear bells, or they see the lightning flash, or they hear the thunder, or maybe something like that has to happen to them. I remember the night that I came. I came in a, the crowd was much smaller than this, but I came forward and stood there, almost turned around and went back, because I wondered, what in the world am I doing down here? all my school friends looking on. I knew they were going to kid me the next day, and I knew that they were going to laugh at me. But I stood there because I deeply wanted Christ. I was a member of the church. I'm sure my pastor was shocked. He thought I was one of his best young members. I was vice president of the Young People's Society of the church. But I knew I really didn't know Christ. I didn't have any personal relationship with him. So I stood there, and the lady standing next to me was crying. I didn't feel like crying. I didn't feel much at all. And I thought to myself, there's something wrong. There's nothing happening to me. But it did happen. Deep in my heart, when I went home that night, we lived on a farm in the foothills of North Carolina, and I looked out over the moonlit fields, and into the woods beyond. And I got on my knees beside the bed and I looked up at that moon for a long time. And I said, oh God, I don't know much about what I've done tonight and I certainly don't know much about you, but what little I do know, please come into my heart tonight and change me and make me a new person. From that moment on, I started being different. I was headed in a new direction. I didn't have anybody to follow me up. I didn't have anybody to talk to me. And I didn't know how to communicate about what I had done. But I knew something was different. I was turned around. I was changed. And that's what conversion means. It means to change, to turn around. I'm going this way, and I turn, and I start this way. And then some people say, well, I don't want to go to church. They refuse Christ because of the church. And some people say, well, the church is full of hypocrites. Well, there are hypocrites in every area of life, I'll tell you. The church is not a society of saints. The church is 
for sinners saved by the grace of God. And the one requirement for membership in the true body of Christ is that you're unworthy to be a member. I'm not worthy to be a member of the body of Christ. I'm not worthy to be a member of the local church where I'm a member. Christ himself founded the church and its purpose is to glorify God by worship. You see, we go to church to worship him. We go to church for the fellowship where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. The church is for strengthening our faith. You take one live coal and put it aside and it'll die, but put it with others and it'll live. The church is an influence for good in the community. The church is for the purpose of witness and service. But I think the main reason a lot of young people don't come to Christ is because they don't want to pay the price. And he will not compromise. He will not negotiate. You either come by repentance and faith or you don't come at all. And a lot of young people don't want to pay that kind of price. If you want an education, you'll pay most anything to get it. If you want wealth, you'll give up all sorts of other things to get money. But Jesus said, even all those things, the scripture says, and the world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abides forever. Jesus said, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Suppose you had all the wealth in the whole world and lost your soul. Would it be worth it? No. You see, your soul is that part of you that lives in your body and it's going to live forever. And the decision that many of you make right here tonight on the satellite places tonight will decide about your soul's eternal destiny. Now, many young people put it off. Behold, now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation, the Bible says. He that hardeneth his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off, and that without remedy. You say, what do I have to do? You have to be willing to say, God, I'm a sinner. That's repentance. Turn from sin. Change your mind. That's repentance. Then faith is where you totally commit your life to Christ. You put him first from now on. Down in Cornwall, on Tuesday night, a 16-year-old girl gave her heart to Christ, we were told this week. And the next night, she found her counsel and said, I want to give you a change of address. I'm going back to live with my parents. They came here tonight, and we were reconciled. She was a runaway. An 18-year-old woman said that she had turned away from God at the age of 11 when her mother died. And as she responded to the invitation right here, on this pitch, she said, I know that I cannot go on any further in my life without Jesus. I'm sorry that I've been rejecting him for so long. A young man recovering from a motorcycle accident in which he nearly died saw the Mission Sheffield posters and thought, I don't know anything about God, but I think I'll go and hear what this man has to say. And he did, and he accepted Christ, and he made this statement. He said, I almost died without faith. Because in that accident, he came close to death. Tonight is the night. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat. Hundreds of you, as we've seen thousands this week here, I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of the platform, here in the center and all around. And as you come, you're saying, I want Christ in my heart. I want him to take over my life. I'm turning my life over to him. I'm not sure. You may go to church. You may not go to church. You may be a good church member. You may not be. I don't know anything about you, but God knows, and you need him, and you may never have another moment like this as long as you live. This is your moment before God. You get up and come. The telephone number you see on your screen is a number that you can call. 
for spiritual help and counseling. And as these many here at the stadium are making their decision for Christ, you make that call right now. People are standing by, ready to talk to you. can pick up your telephone and call that number on the screen. May God help you to make that commitment tonight with these many people that are coming here in Yorkshire, Sheffield, England. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, now, I have several scriptures I'd like to read, but I'm just going to limit myself to this particular scripture. The 14th chapter of John, beginning at verse 16. If ye love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not. Neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Pope John was once asked what the greatest need in the world was, and he said, the teaching and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. My wife and I took a brief vacation several years ago with the great Swiss theologian, Karl Barth. And I asked Dr. Barth, I said, what is going to be the next theological emphasis in the world? And that was before the charismatic movement had come to bloom as we know it today. And Dr. Karl Barth, with great prophetic insight, said, the emphasis is going to be on the work of the Holy Spirit. And the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12, 1, Now concerning matters pertaining to the Spirit, I would not have you ignorant. Now it's impossible to understand the Bible, Christian living, the structure of the church, to understand your own relationship to God without the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. Now we have uh, what is called today the charismatic movement. And I see it throughout the world. I see it in their, all sorts of phases. I've been to some countries where they say that the charismatic movement is moving so great in the Roman Catholic Church, and I find that those people have never spoken in tongues at all. They've just had a new experience with Christ, and yet they call themselves charismatic. And they are right, because every true Christian is charismatic. Every true Christian is charismatic. It's the word charismata, where we get our word charisma from, and that is the plural for charis, which means gift, a gift of grace. Now, there are 20 or 21 or 19, no matter how you count them. In my book, I say 20, but I think it's only a sample list of the gifts of the Spirit. But every true believer has a gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift of administration, the gift of helps, the gift of knowledge, the gift of wisdom, the gift of an evangelist, the gift of a pastor, the gift of a teacher. Whatever the gift is, it is given by the will of the Holy Spirit. It's a gift from the Holy Spirit to you, to help you, to guide you, to lead you, to strengthen you, to edify, to build up the body of Christ and to witness for Christ to the world round about us. And so in that sense, every true believer is charismatic. 
Now let's look a little bit at the word, the work of the Holy Spirit. First of all, he's not a, he is not an it. I hear people talk about, I want it. He is a person. The Bible says that he's not something, he's someone. He is God. There are three persons in the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You say, I don't understand that, and neither do I. I'm not going to try to explain it, at least at this point. Except by faith that there's one God expressed in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Now, the Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit is all-powerful. Micah 3, 6 says, I'm full of power by the Spirit of the Lord. The Bible says he's present everywhere. No matter where you go, he's there. Whether shall I flee from thy spirit or whether shall I flee from thy presence? Psalm 139, 7. That is one of the reasons that Christ went away. He went to get out of a human body because Christ could only be in one place at one time. He was confined to his body. He went away so the Holy Spirit could come in his place and be everywhere at the same time. The Holy Spirit can be in your heart and my heart, and we may live a thousand miles apart. He said, it is expedient for you that I go away. And if I go not away, the Holy Spirit will not come, he said. So he said, I have to go away so that the Holy Spirit can come and do his great work throughout the history of the church. Now, he also has all knowledge, the Bible says, but God hath received them unto us by his Spirit, for by the Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. It is the Holy Spirit that teaches us and takes us deeper and deeper as we go along in our Christian life. Now, in our Christian life, we are to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ, but we can only grow by the help of the Holy Spirit because the moment that you receive Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart. Your body becomes the temple of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is there to help you live the Christian life. There's not a person in this audience that can be a Christian without the Holy Spirit. There's not a person in this audience that can follow Christ without the help of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is extremely important, all important in our lives. The Bible also says that the Holy Spirit has all knowledge, but God hath revealed unto them by his Spirit, for he searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. But in the book of Revelation it says that he has seven eyes. The word seven is the word of perfection in the Scriptures. He has seven eyes, perfect eyes. He sees everything that goes on. He knows what goes on in your heart. He knows what goes on in your mind. Nothing is hidden from him. The searching, probing power of the Holy Spirit with those seven eyes that see in every direction. He has perfect knowledge. And then the Bible says he's eternal in Hebrews 9:14, we have the phrase, the eternal spirit. He is the co-eternal with God the Father and God the Son. To explain the Trinity again, I do not know how, but let's say you take an apple. You have the peeling on the outside, you have the meat, and then you have the core. But it all makes up the apple. Or you have uh, ice and water and vapor. They're all the same, but they take different forms. Those are poor illustrations of the mighty Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, he's called holy. One hundred times he's referred to as the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost is the old English translation. And the Bible says, God says, be ye holy even as I am holy. The Holy Spirit's job, one of his jobs is to help make you holy. And we ought to be more holy today than we were yesterday. We should always be growing more into the image and conformity to Jesus Christ. And it's the Holy Spirit that helps us in this growing process. Now, the Bible also teaches that where he is, there's liberty. Our brother a moment ago talked about liberty, the liberty that he has in Jesus Christ. He gives us liberty out of the bondage of the law and out of the bondage of legalism. 
because you see even though you may be a slave to sin to drugs to alcohol or whatever it may be you're a slave of sin Jesus said but Jesus Christ comes and liberates us because of his death on the cross and the Holy Spirit also liberates us and there's liberty where the Spirit is and I can go into a service and tell you in five minutes in that service if those people have been liberated by the Holy Spirit the work of the Holy Spirit what is the work of the Holy Spirit the work of the Holy Spirit first of all is to convict he convicts us of sin and when he has come he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment in John 16 he uses a mother's prayers as our brother a moment ago said or a tragic experience or a pastor's sermon or some other experience maybe this telecast he will use to convict you of your sin and of your need of turning your life over totally to Jesus Christ that's the work of the Holy Spirit and many times he disturbs you I've had people get up out of their seats and come and stand in front and shake their fist in my face they were so disturbed by the Spirit of God but they'll come back one man came back the next night and accepted Christ one man came at five o'clock in the morning to our hotel to receive Christ the Holy Spirit sometimes makes you angry he disturbs you you don't like for people to point right in your direction and say I'm a you're a sinner the Holy Spirit points right at you he puts a dagger in your heart and he says you're a sinner you need to repent we don't like to hear that but that's the work of the Holy Spirit and without the work of the Holy Spirit you could never go to heaven you could never have your sins forgiven you could never be saved and the Holy Spirit has been working with some of you all week whether you've been here or haven't been here and then secondly he gives new life you see the Bible says that we are dead in sins and trespasses our spirit within us made in the image of God is dead toward God and what does mankind need tonight mankind needs life all have sinned therefore all are dead toward God and a dead man needs to life and the Holy Spirit comes to give us that new life in Jesus Christ Bertrand Russell once wrote to a friend I could think of nothing but suicide for over man and his works he said night falls pitless and dark is that the way you feel night is falling pitless and dark for you you see man without God is dead but Jesus said except a man be born again he cannot see the kingdom of God you must be born again and the Holy Spirit is the one that does the work of making you a born-again person it's a supernatural act not by works of righteousness which we've done not all your good works and all the good things that you've done are going to save you Titus a Paul said to Titus but according to his mercy he saved us we're saved by the mercy of God by the grace of God I don't deserve heaven I don't deserve to have my sins forgiven I don't deserve to be saved I don't deserve to have this peace in my heart I don't deserve this deep-seated joy that I have it's by grace by mercy something I didn't earn something I didn't work for I just received a gift the gift of God the gift of salvation but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit it's the Holy Spirit that does it and then thirdly as I've mentioned already he indwells many of you are spiritually dead and surfeited with the issues or with the life in which we live today in our hedonistic culture the Holy Spirit can come into you and indwell you right now you can start all over again brand new life the life of the Spirit the Holy Spirit indwelling you the Holy Spirit pulsating spiritual life through and in you and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and ye shall keep my judgments and do them says Ezekiel 36
Think of it. God said, I'll put my spirit in you. I'll come to live in you. Think of your body housing God. And that's what happens. Your body becomes the temple where God dwells by his Holy Spirit. That's the reason we should never take anything unclean into our bodies. That's the reason we should discipline our bodies. That's the reason we should watch our bodies because it's the temple of the Holy Spirit. God loves your body. He doesn't want it polluted and fouled up by fleshly lust and things that you give yourself to. He dwelleth with you and shall be in you, said Jesus in our text. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you, said 1 Corinthians 3.16. And then fourthly, the Holy Spirit gives you power to serve Christ, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. I can't do the work I can do, I'm doing without the power of the Holy Spirit. People always, you know, bless their hearts, I love newspaper reporters. Some of them are my best friends. And, uh, but many of them who do not know Christ cannot possibly understand what it's all about. They study and they try to penetrate and they try to figure it out. They think it's advertisement. They think it's promotion. They think it's uh, something else. One fellow said that he knew the secret of, of why the crowds came to these meetings. He said, it was my eyes. <laughs> well, you can't see my eyes four rows back. No, I'll tell you the secret. It's the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, where Christ is exalted. I don't claim to be a great preacher. I'm just a communicator of God's message. He called me and gave me that gift. He gave Cliff his gift. He gave Ted his gift. He gave Bev Shea his and John his and all these team members. He gave them separate gifts. He gives as he wills. There are some of the, the team members here that we have with us and some of the people here that can do things I would give anything in my possession to be able to do by way of organization, by way of music. I wish I could sing like some of these people. I can't sing a note. In fact, I don't even sing when I'm standing beside somebody because I throw them off. <laughs> and I'm not the greatest organizer in the world. But God gave me my little gift, the gift of communicating the gospel. And the thing that counts is the message that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, that he rose again according to the Scripture, that he's coming back again, and that he's ready to come into your heart right now by the Holy Spirit and make you a new person. That's the gospel. That's the one message Christ gave me. That's the one message God gave me. I was reading about something in Wakefield, England the other day, and a woman had tried her driver's test for the 38th time and failed. <laughs> 38 times and failed. Perhaps you've tried that many times for a license spiritually to sit in the driver's seat of your life, but it hasn't worked. How many people come, have gone to meetings and you've rededicated your life and you've come forward or you've gone out of there and said, I'm going to live different or I'm going to do better. It, it just hasn't worked. This may be the 38th time and tonight it may work because you're going to turn your life over to Christ in the right way by repentance of your sin and by faith in Christ and the Holy Spirit is going to come supernaturally and renew you and give you a new nature. And then the Holy Spirit produces the fruit of the Spirit. What are the fruit? Nine of them. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness and temperance. That's produced by the Holy Spirit. There are people that you may not be able to love normally. They're just not your kind. But the Holy Spirit will give you the power to love them. And the greatest thing in the world, what is it? Love. The greatest evidence that you know Christ is love. And you can't love that person. Well, I know there are some people that are just hard to love. 
but the Holy Spirit can love through you. He can love through you. And then you, you don't have joy. There are a lot of times that I feel that I don't have joy, and I get on my knees and I say, Lord, where is the fruit of the Spirit of joy in my life? And the joy is there, down deep. It's a deep river. Whatever the circumstances, there's a river of joy. And then the peace that passeth understanding comes from the Holy Spirit. Whatever the circumstances, let the world fall apart. I have peace in my heart. I know where I'm going. I know where I've been and I know where I'm here by the Holy Spirit. Do you know Christ? You see, the Holy Spirit comes to do this. He comes to magnify, to glorify, and exalt the Son. John 16, 13 says, He shall not speak of himself. The Holy Spirit shall not speak of himself. In other words, we're not to go around saying the Holy Spirit this, the Holy Spirit this, the Holy Spirit that, and ignore Christ. He came to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ. He came to glorify Christ. And the Holy Spirit is pleased when you glorify Christ in your life. Now, the Bible says that you can sin against the Holy Spirit. The Bible says you can anger the Spirit. The Bible says you can grieve the Spirit. The Bible says you can lie against the Holy Spirit. The Bible says you can tempt the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that you can resist the Holy Spirit. And if you resist the Holy Spirit, there's no forgiveness. Because you see, it's the Holy Spirit that draws you to Christ. It is the Holy Spirit that convicts you of your need of Christ. And if you resist him, keep resisting, your heart getting harder and harder all the time, then there's no more repentance, no more salvation. There's only one way of salvation, and that's Christ. A solemn thing to resist the Holy Spirit. You detect his voice, and yet you deliberately refuse. It's a dangerous thing to resist the Spirit. He that despiseth Moses' law died without mercy unto two or three witnesses. Of how much sore a punishment suppose ye shall be, thought worthy who have trodden underfoot the Son of God, and have counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing, and have done despite unto the Spirit of grace. I'm asking you tonight to give in to the call of the Holy Spirit. I'm asking you to come by the hundreds and say, I want Christ in my life to be my Lord and my Savior, and I want to be sure of it. You may be a faithful in the church, but you really don't know Christ. Or you may not have any religion. You may be Catholic or Protestant or Jewish or no religion at all. I don't know who you are or what you are. But I would assume that the majority of the people here tonight are churchgoers. And I know thousands of churchgoers that need to come to Christ in a new way and have a new experience with the Lord Jesus Christ, led by the Holy Spirit. Because you see, there's many people that need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I don't have time to go into what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit or to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. All that's in my book because I'm here tonight to talk to you about what the Holy Spirit can do for you right tonight, right here and now. And I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat, hundreds of you, as we've seen night after night. I want you to come and stand here in front of the platform and say by coming, I want Christ in my heart. I want to know I'm going to heaven. I want my sins forgiven. I want to start a new life. If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait. If you come from that top balcony up there, it'll take you about two minutes. So start now. You can bring your friend with you. And there are thousands of you here tonight that God has been speaking to. You get up and come right now, quickly. And say by coming, I want Christ in my heart. I want the Holy Spirit to come into my life tonight. I want Christ to forgive my sins.